Hi, everyone. I'm just going to give it a couple seconds as people come on into this session. This is the 2.30 Fireside Chat with uh, Professor Jonathan Tran and President Craig Barnes about race, the church, and Asian America. Excellent. I will make some introductions. President Craig Barnes was raised on Long Island, New York. After graduating from the King's College and Princeton Theological Seminary, he received a PhD in the history of Christianity from the University of Chicago. He has served as a pastor to three congregations, including the National Presbyterian Church in Washington, DC. He also served as the Manali Professor of Pastoral Ministry at Pittsburgh Seminary, while also serving as the senior pastor of Shadyside Presbyterian Church. In 2012, he was elected president of Princeton Theological Seminary. He has, he has published nine books, including his latest, Diary of a Pastor's Soul. He, uh, he has also served as an editor at large and frequent contributor to the Christian century for many years. Welcome, President Barnes. Dr. Jonathan Tran is Associate Professor of Religion at Baylor University, where he holds the George W. Baines Chair of Religion. His forthcoming book titled Asian Americans and the Spirit of Racial Capitalism will be published fall 2021 with Oxford University Press. Welcome, Jonathan Tran. And President Barnes, um, the floor is yours. Thank you. I want to join others who have welcomed you to this extraordinary conference. And I want to thank Dr. David Chow, the director of the Asian American program at PTS for his leadership of this event. I know he's been joined by hardworking graduate students, Bonnie Lin at PTS and Darren Yall at the university, as well as others, including uh, our fabulous speakers. We are all deeply in your debt for convening these conversations at this critical time and our life together as a society. Now, I have the pleasure of interviewing Dr. Jonathan Tran, the Associate Professor of Philo Philosophical Theology at Baylor University. And it seems to me that the field of Asian American theology is in some ways still emerging and developing and uh, clearly, Dr. Tran is one of its emerging voices. So we're absolutely honored to have him among our speakers at this event. And I get to learn a lot by asking him some pressing questions. So welcome, Jonathan. Uh, thank you, President Barnes. And I'm really grateful to be with you and with the rest of the conference, uh, which has already been super energizing and uh, encouraging. OK, let's dive in. Jonathan, uh, as David just uh, indicated, you have literally written the book on Asian Americans, Asian American racism, a racism against Asian Americans, and its relationship to Christianity. As a way into our broader conversation, can you start by telling us about this new book? Sure. So let me say a few things about what the book is trying to say about race and racism, and then I'll say some things about um, what it claims about Asian Americans specifically. So in the United States, we tend to think about racism along something like this. Uh, people are possessed of bad ideas. They have bad ideas, false ideas, false impressions, prejudices, stereotypes about other people. Sometimes those prejudices or stereotypes get institutionalized. Um, you know, bad thoughts they might have about Asian Americans, the idea, for example, that Asian, all Asian Americans are all, you know, Chinese and all Chinese people are bearers of the virus. Uh, or perhaps they think, you know, they have false impressions about the human status of other people. And so the thinking here is you have some bad ideas and then that's the source of American racism. If this is what racism is, then the corrective is clearly to correct the bad ideas, to, co to correct the stereotypes, to show a that not all Asian Americans are Chinese and not all Chinese people are people are bearers of the coronavirus, um, or to uh, play up the human status of certain racial groups. Um, what I want to ask is this: if that's what racism is, and the solution is that simple, 
how do we come to terms with the world in which we find ourselves? I want us to ask a different kind of question about racism, right? And the question is something like this. If it's universally understood at this point that racism is a bad and evil and destructive reality, why does it persist, right? We wanna ask who does it benefit? What work is it doing? Right? What are the structures of our society that deeply depend on racism? So it's not as easy as saying, right, racism is an easy and obvious problem and we need to kind of get rid of bad ideas. The reality is our world is structured by extraordinary dehumanizing forms of inequality, violence, um, soul crushing inhumanity. What we wanna ask is what role does racism play in that system, right? We wanna ask the question, what does racism do? My thought is something like this, that we have a world of inequality and injustice, right? It's an inequality of resources, an inequality of access, an inequality of visibility, of being known and understood, of having compassion and empathy directed towards you, of being heard, of being seen. And what you have is an inequality. And what the racism does is justify the inequality, right? It says something like, right, it's, it's the ultimate form of gaslighting. It's saying, well, you're poor, right? Uh, say I'm driving around town and I see a lot of black and brown people in my city in Waco uh, and they lived in impoverished, uh, dilapidated housing. And I say to myself, well, of course they do. They're black and brown. It's something natural to who they are. It's something about their race. Or we look at the, I, I was reading this amazing st uh, statistic the other day that uh, Filipina um, frontline healthcare workers constitute about 3% of that population. And yet they've comprised nearly 30% of the fatalities around coronavirus, right? See how the racism works. It's, you have this system of extraordinary inequality and then the race comes on top of it. It justifies it. it, it it's almost like it gives it a, a, a veneer of respectability. If that's what racism is, then it's not at all going to be as easy as correcting for bad source material, getting people to think better thoughts, to educating each other, right? To, for me to clarify that I'm not a virus or saying to people, those people actually are human, right? One thing we have to get into our souls right, is that um, white Americans did not enslave black people because they are le less than human, right? as if they made some kind of metaphysical category mistake. The tragedy of American chattel slavery is not that white folks made a mistake about the human status of black folks. The tragedy is they enslaved and dehumanized people they could not fail to know were human. If we are going to come to terms with the racist society that we're gonna live in, we have to ask much harder, difficult, systemic, structural questions, right? We're gonna to need to begin to ask, what are the major parts of our society that we're going to need to dismantle so that race doesn't do the work that it does? Let me give you an example, a kind of sign of hope in recent, in recent months. Uh, the George Floyd uh, murder, right? raised this extraordinary public conversation. And it was one about the police. And it was specifically, you know, it, was, it came under the name of defunding the police. What this conversation was asking is this, the way we deal with inequality, the persistence of poverty, um, injustice is we police it. And then we get surprised that when our police then act in forms of violence towards those scenarios. There's absolutely no doubt that we need to hold the police accountable and specific police officers accountable. But it's too easy to scapegoat specific individuals when what we've done with the police is ask them to police poverty. That's a much harder question. So the defunding the police move with, I mean, uh, movement was the question, is police and prisons the best way to deal with poverty, right? What do we leave standing? When we send Officer Chauvin to prison, as we absolutely should, what do we leave standing? We leave the entire structure of inequality and justice standing, right? And we pat ourselves on the back, thinking that we've dealt with the source reality, when in fact we've largely left the infrastructure that conspires against Black life standing. How do we begin to ask these kinds of questions? This is a much more difficult reality. And when we began to ask these questions, right, 
then we began to come to terms with the whole of our life. My thought is this, racism is the use of race categories to justify domination and exploitation. Anti-racism then needs to do two things. First, it needs to resist and challenge forms of racialization. Please hear me, I'm not advocating for a kind of insipid form of colorblindness. We need to keep track of race categories for the ways they do damage, right? But we do need to resist forms of racialization because they contribute to domination. So we need to do that. And second, we need to speak different idioms of political economy. We have to reimagine how we imagine our world, our relationships with one another, right? And we need to begin to ask these questions about our structures. But what I'm, the story I'm trying to tell, I think is also a story of hope. If race was created to divide us, that also means that insofar as race is a construction of power, there's then nothing fundamentally that separates us. And here I'm not simply talking about respective peoples of color, but I'm also talking about our white brothers and sisters, right? Remember race was a divide and conquer that was meant to dominate poor white people as well. And so if we're gonna move forward, we're gonna need to have expansive imaginative capacities that sees the full spectrum of oppression and its full structural reality. Now, let me, let me turn to the question of Asian Americans. I came to think about this way, of, this different way of thinking about race and racism through two fundamental sources. One, the black radical tradition, and the other one was thinking really hard about Asian Americans and my own experience in America, right? So here's the central problematic I began with in thinking about this book and, and kind of this journey into anti-racism. Why is it that anti-racism tends to marginalize those already marginalized by racism, right? Why is it the way we talk about race and racism, right? Already in kind of in erasing and rendering invisible those who are rendered invisible by the structures of racism in the first place. I think the way most anti-racists have tried to think about this with say Asian Americans or say Latinx communities is we've tried to expand out the categories. We've taken the standard categories given to us about race and racism and say, well, maybe we just expand them out a little bit, we diversify them, and then it'll better be able to capture Asian Americans or Latinx communities. I think we've tried that for a long time, but we, what we need to come to terms with it, it, that does not work, right? We are perpetually made invisible. We are perpetually, right? It's not an accident that we're put on the margins of anti-racism. It is necessary to the way the anti-racism conversation goes in America. Now, coming to terms with that is an extraordinary painful reality that matches the ongoing painful reality of our lives. So what I did is I took that problematic and I, I turned it around. Rather than trying to figure out how to include people that look like me and have had my experiences into anti-racism, what I try to think about is this. What is wrong with the standard anti-racism conversation that it, that it perpetually marginalizes me? Then we begin to see a different set of questions. We, 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 we realize that the received categories simply do not work for us. And we have to begin to stand up and say this. My thought is going for the most interesting, exciting, and frankly, painful and difficult questions clearly will not be with racists. It will be with other committed anti-racists. So let me give you two example, quick examples of the ways this, the received categories do not work for us. Uh, in, in the first part of the book, I look at a, a, a kind of historic Asian American community, Chinese migrants in the Deep South following uh, Reconstruction. There have been some academic treatments of this, some ways Americans have used standard black and white race categories to understand these people. One of, one of, which, uh, one of which is to say, here's an example of um, Asian people becoming white. And I'll say something about that. The other one is, here's an example of black Asian solidarity. Both of those are half right, but also profoundly half wrong, right? So the story that says the Chinese came to the Mississippi South, they were first seen as black and then they eventually became white. And the, the narrative of their story in America is one of becoming white or, you know, cozying up to whiteness. I think any of us in an, who are Asian American know that this is a profoundly limiting category. How in the world could it be just those two things? But there was a reading of the Mississippi Chinese that this became sacrosanct. That, and, and of course, we've now all inherited this, right? If I live in a certain part of the city, people will say you're becoming white. 
right? And when they, or if you, if I take up a certain kind of job or speak a kind of way, well, you're becoming white or you're, you're a Twinkie or something like that. And, and notice in the background, this extraordinarily pejorative view of black folks, right? What we need to say is that received category simply does not work. It's not a matter of expanding out the categories. It is the nature of race language to think in terms of white and blackness as subordinate to it. The substance of race in America is white and black. If we continue as anti-racists to commit to race thinking, we will continue to commit to the binary that in a sense will perpetually marginalize us. Uh, let me ask, offer another category, and this one's even more painful to talk about. The other way the story of these Mississippi Chinese were, were articulated was one of solidarity with uh, say black and yellow people. Uh, and there is no doubt there were profound forms of solidarity because the, the Chinese people weren't allowed to live with white folks. The only place they could find their homes and their stores and their businesses were in the black parts of town. And there were remarkable types of friendships at times. Uh, and this is a story we like to tell about solidarity, right? The idea is just because you're people of color, you're going to get along. Just because you're mutually oppressed, you're going to see each other. That's half right. The reality is. A lot of that history, right, was Chinese people exploiting their black neighbors, right? They, they, they created an entire business plan around this. This is a much more painful thing to think about. But my thinking is this, if we build our notions of political solidarity on half-truths, we will be broken on those lies when those half-truths half reveal themselves. Solidarity requires, if it is not gonna take on an anemic form us being serious and honest about what we do to each other under the dual pressures of oppression, right? These Chinese folks were trying to survive extraordinary pressures, um, nothing that I've ever had to go through. And in that, they succumbed to certain forms of racialized thinking that did real damage to their neighbors. We need to tell the whole truth about that. It's the same thing with how we live within, the, within uh, respective communities now, right? If we don't develop these serious forms of speech, being honest with ourselves, um, then we will probably we will always hide from the lies that undergird our lives. But we will never build out a true coalitional politics because we would need to first be honest with ourselves about this possibility, right? And, and this is why this is where I think the conversation in the next few years has to come to terms with these more difficult realities. Otherwise, when we see people of color hurting each other we simply will not know what to say. We'll be rendered silent. And unless we get there, uh, we have no possibility of moving forward until we're honest about what we've done and what we can do through that honesty. In, a, in addition to these uh, critically important and profound uh, issues of economics, and uh, language and categories. I wanna shift us just a little bit, weave in how Christianity fits into some of this as well. Yeah, thank you for that question. I mean, I think it's common place right now to write and describe about the violence of the church. Uh, I came to Christianity late as an adult, so I did not grow up in Christianity. One of the primary barriers to my becoming a Christian and my continuing to be a Christian, to be honest with you, uh, is this the synonymous reality between three things, the American church, uh, racism, and white people. That alone, I think, is oftentimes an argument not to be Christian. I need other witnesses, like some of the, some of the people that have spoken today. They, they help me believe in God because the evidence of the church will almost always tell me otherwise. But what I understand myself doing both in this book, but vocationally as a Christian, is I wanna tell a Christian story. And I believe it's an act of faith to speak within the witness of what scripture says about what the spirit can do through God's people. To me, doing that is not evading the church's racism, it's properly holding it accountable. So the story I tell is something like this. Uh, it's it's the broadly narr broad narrative of Christianity, right? The world is God's. God made it to reflect the beauty and goodness and truth of who God is. That is an inexpungible reality. I began there, 
from there, there's this description of how sin works, right? Uh, we academic nerds use the language of like structural and system, system, uh, systematic racism. What I think we mean there is it's just deeply relational, that what sin gets into is the kind of connective tissue of creation. It gets in everywhere. And so to talk about structural and systematic racism in terms of things like political economy that I've talked about is to say that sin is destroying and breaking down all the connective tissue that God uses to express goodness, truth, and beauty. But to hold on to this story as a Christian story is to also to speak about possibilities of hope within it. So then the next part of the story is to say that regardless of how deep sin goes within the structures of creation, no matter how much it tries to tear apart those kind of the connective tissues of relationships, relationships between persons, relationships between time, history, creatures, God and creation, no matter how deep sin goes, God goes deeper, right? In, in the language of scripture, even if I put my home, make my home in Sheol, there you are. It, it is the claim that God wins this story. We have to begin there because those of us who have, who have been fighting against racism in our lives, we know it is not sustainable unless we tell this story as a story about God, right? And so I go from there and say, if God is right, if God is the the thing that holds all this together, right? What does God look like translated into the material world of racism? I believe it looks like justice and mercy. Right, justice and mercy is God seeping through every crevice of creation. What I try to say in the book is justice and mercy are natural to this world because God is natural to this world. So then how do we li live into that? What I want us to think about is in the act of anti-racism, it's not the primary key for Christians, right, of theology. It's not resistance, though I hear my brothers and sisters that that's what it always feels like. We're just resisting something. The primary key of Christianity is proclamation. We are living into what the Spirit is doing. And the attempt of the book is to keep both in focus and to believe that the broad arc of what Scripture tells is a story about this being God's world, sin intervening in this world, but it does not dominate and control the world to the end, that God wins. Right, and so then it's the attempt to speak into these realities and then kind of get into this as a Christian story, which is critically important, I think, in this moment. The, the last few months relating to anti-AAPI violence have been horrible, with literally thousands of incidents being reported in the last year images of Asian Americans being targeted, harassed, pushed, attacked, in some cases killed. The horrific murders in Atlanta where Asian women were selectively targeted seemed to both epitomize and deepen the horror. We know some of this has to do with the pandemic and with the political climate around the pandemic, but these also follow historic patterns. Can you talk to us a little bit about how you've been thinking about this? Yeah, the, the, the events which for a lot of, of us were epitomized in the Atlanta shootings uh, just some weeks ago, um, right? It, the, the, it was an intensification of our history, but not a divergence from it. Um, right? I, I mean, I'm older than, the vast majority of people on this call, I'm, I believe, but I grew up at a time where racism was not only um, uh, accepted, it was expected, right? Walking down the street, I just expected to be called a chink or a nip or a jap. Um, getting, you know, I remember when I was in, you know, seventh grade, some kid yelled some word at me uh, and, you know, spit in my face. Uh, one lasting memory is, you know, my brother taught me to fight. I, as I mentioned, I wasn't a Christian, so I just got in a lot of fist fights around this stuff. And I remember I used to get in a lot of fist fights after kids called me Bruce Lee, you know, just completely missing the irony of the whole thing. Um, but yeah, the, the racism was constant. Um, 
I mean, my, our good friends have already given us a wonderful history uh, in the earlier sessions. Uh, what I would add to that is that we need to remember that American, I mean, America opened up to Asia around 1965, as Dr. Chow was talking about earlier. Um, just prior to that, America had fought in three costly wars with Asian nations, largely as outcroppings of right colonialism and American imperialism, first with the Japanese, then with the Koreans, and then with the Vietnamese, which is how I came to America. This forever would skew how Americans saw people like us. They, the, the, the notion of peril then was a real threat insofar as they had been fighting wars in America. Uh, we, we, we certainly know the recent event in Atlanta, uh, but you know, may, maybe other people don't know this, but in 1989, right, Patrick Purdy, a kind of drifter, who had been a community college student, you know, where he talked about there's too many Southeast Asians around here. Well, on, on right in, on January 17th, 1989, um, this man took a sniper rifle and killed South, you know, five Southeast Asian kids. Right, that was that was my story. I grew up in the 80s under all this racism, and it just um, you know, th it, that's just what we expected. Those are the kinds of things we expected to happen. I mean, in America, in the Vietnam War, there's, you know, a million deaths among soldiers, over 3 million civilians killed in this war. And so the association with America and death and killing yellow people was part of what I understood, just like I imagine that's how people saw me as perilous. Um, so, you know, I don't need to say much more than that because our friends have already given this history. Uh, but these things are continuous with the very origins of the arrival of the first Asians, right, brought in as exploitable labor, um, going exactly back to that structure I talked about where what race is, is the use of categories, racial categories to justify forms of exploitation. That's what our story has always been about. There's, again, there's not a great divergence here. It's, co it's continuous. There's an intensification at moments. But if we're going to be honest about the story of America, then it is definitely includes the continuous oppression and oftentimes significant forms of violence against uh, Asian American folks. Thank you. I, I want to stay with this just a little bit longer. Um, one of the things that I found surprising is how hard it has been for Americans to come to terms with this recent spike in violence. Because of the churches and ministries I've worked with and most directly and, and the conversations I've had with PTS students and faculty, I've been aware of these things, but I, I've noticed that many Americans struggle to believe Asian Americans even suffer racism. Can you give us some insight on that? Yeah. Um... Uh, yeah, I hadn't seen a lot of my basketball friends for all of COVID, and I, I play a lot of basketball with this group of uh, dudes from Waco, a bunch of you know white black folks mostly, um, good friends, trusted friends, and I I'm guessing I'm I'm the only Asian American they know. Uh, well, of course, we've been seeing a lot in the news about this anti Asian American racism and its intense its intensities, and so I saw them for the first time, and and they started peppering almost as soon as I got there to play basketball. Hey, Tran, is, is this stuff real, right? Is this really happening? Have you ever experienced this? You know, and, I, and my first response is, I, I'm just here to play basketball. <laughs> um, I wasn't sure how to take the question. I wasn't sure if it was like a good faith question because, you know, the experience I just told you, it, that's just part of my life. It's what's sad to me about that kind of question, right? Let's, let's say we treat it as a good faith, good world question, is I've heard these questions my whole life as an academic. I remember a number of us, uh, some of my academic friends on this call, right? We 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 uh, did a book a few years ago, and very prominent um, race scholar, uh, you know, he began by a confession, which was, I, I confess, I did not know that Asian Americans suffered racism. I was really grateful for the confession. I was utterly shocked that that's the reality. But I I hear this stuff all the time. I hear it at my own university. Like we have no concepts or categories to what to know what's happening on, on our campuses, right? We don't know we don't know what's happening on in the streets across America. Like we we so lack even minimally sufficient categories to take in, say, violence against indigenous peoples or African Americans or what's happening on the southern border, right? It, it, it's almost like we're asking an impossible task to even broaden a little bit to see these other forms of racism.
So I, I think there's kind of two things, and they're both hard to say. The latter will be harder to say, but let me kind of take the first. One of the reasons Asian Americans are not seen as suffering racism is, of course, what we all know is the incipient, incipient um, kind of pernicious, what's called the model minority myth, which is, you know, we're all doing well. And if you look at our college graduation rates and say income levels, we're all doing well. Of course, the problem is if you actually drill down in the numbers, like, you know, our friends who are social scientists who actually know things, it's a much uglier picture, right? You know, I mean, Asian American, here I am, I have a, you know, advanced degree. Vietnamese have very, very low college rates, college graduation rates. My, my brothers and sisters from Cambodia, Laos, right? Some of the lowest graduation rates in the country, right? Um, most people don't know this, but um, during COVID, during the massive forms of an unemployment, Chinese Americans in New York City were crushed by that reality. We, you know, we didn't think that because we thought all the Chinese Americans in New York City were on Wall Street, right? Or they were, you know, or they're doctors. Well, surprise, there's a lot of them as first response, I mean, uh, kind of essential workers, workers in restaurants, they were crushed. Now imagine they go get social, I mean, social benefits and then the person handing out the social benefits are thinking, you don't qualify, you're Asian, you're, you're doing well, right? And so, so the model minority myth is this kind of pernicious perception of us, uh, of trying to group you know, the entire people who are Asian descendant into a very narrow category and then dismissing it. Of course, there's even worse forms of what it does, right? Uh, another pernicious effect is it asks some Asian Americans, it tempts us to live into the stereotype, uh, which includes forms of exploitation. But the other thing it does is it wedges us against our black and brown and uh, indigenous brothers and sisters and says, look, y'all, this is how you should be minorities in this country, right? The, you're, this is the witness that Asian, you know, minority people can make it. The rest of you ought to get in line. And it's just devastating, right? It's devastating for other people of color. It's devastating for our friendships with them, right? So, so you, ha you have these stereotypes and, you know, the other thing is the idea that I just, I'm not truly American. I, I've been here for like 40 years, but I'm not truly American. And so therefore if racism happens to be, it's, it's not that big of a deal, right? It's not clear that it really matters that much, right? So the first reason we don't, it's hard for people to get their mind around what's happening right now is they just don't think people like us suffer racism. If anything, they think we're unjustly benefited by racism. Um, the other side is this, and this is harder to say, um, is that the white racial imagination or the white racialized imagination has so little capacity to take in what it has done, right? It, it already is so meager and deficient and anemic that it's barely scratching the surface of anti-Blackness. It, it hasn't even begun to touch the reality of indigenous peoples, right? It, like right now, we Asian Americans should be very careful about this moment in the sun we're having. On the one hand, it's amazing that people are asking this question. But what do we do with the, the fact that children are being caged at the southern border at the same time? We have to remember that the terms of race are, are always built in with forms of race ranking. If we too quickly celebrate our moment in the sun, then we, in a sense, kowtow to the game that is perpetually putting us against one another. The reality is that the white racial imagine, racialized imagination right, is nourished specifically on Black suffering. There is a part of that to me that is right, that we need to, not, not that it's nourished on black suffering, but we absolutely need to attend to the story of anti-blackness in America. I, I absolutely in agreement that it runs right through the story of whatever America is. But how do we celebrate and tell that story and honor it while also expanding our imaginative capacities to see other forms of suffering? This is why the, one of the biggest temptations in these moments where we experience racism is forms of racial nationalism, where we think our story is privileged, right? Where we're, our oppression is the greatest. We're the most marginalized. That's just playing the same game that race has always played, which first said white people are absolutely the true race, right? Black people are secondary to that. Asian people are third, right? To jockey for position with other people of color, Right? As good as that is, that may feel and tempting that we get our moment in the sun is simply to recapitulate to the very structures of white supremacy.
What we need to do is expand out our categories, create modes of formation and likely transformation where our imaginative capacities open up. I don't know if people have read this book by um, Heather McGee called The Sum of Us, right? She shows how, uh, right, it begins with this really uh, kind of extraordinary moment in American history where the court, the federal courts have desegregated public pools. Um, uh, but rather than kind of sharing the pools with black people, white people just close the pools, right? Which it just sounds absurd to me. Well, why do they want to do that? And and what um, what this researcher shows, McGee shows, uh, is that um, it's part of the racist imagination to always think in zero sum categories, right? It always to operate in a zero sum analysis. If we give something to black people, white people lose something, right? Um, uh, if, if we give something to yellow people, right, white people lose something. What we absolutely cannot do is jump in on that kind of thinking. That, to, that we need to take something away from other people so that we can have some space, right? We need other imaginative capacities, other ways of imagining this, other ways of seeing the world. I, I think if, right, one of the main things I say in the book is I, I, I um, juxtapose what I call racial capitalism, which is my definition, borrowing from the black tradition, black radical tradition, right? Racial capitalism is the use of race to justify domination and exploitation. I juxtapose that to something uh, the theolo theological tradition is often called the divine economy, which is another word for the Christian gospel. And, and the divine economy in the gospel is simply the idea that in God's world, there will be enough because God is the one who makes this world possible. So then if we can lean to the capacities that the spirit through the spirit's work of justice and mercy are opening up, then we no longer think in, in terms of these zero sum analysis and we begin to open up these imaginative capacities, right? It, another way the church has always thought about this is the sacramental reality of God in the world. The, the, God, the, the, the God has set up the world in a way that is nourishing to the world. What is sin? The attempt to reject that nourishment, to privatize it, to own it, to use racial categories, to dominate, and exploit, and then justify, right? If we can live into the divine economy, then other things begin to open up for us. I have uh, so enjoyed uh, learning from you. I, I'm, not I'm not sure if, if this has been a lecture or a uh, a sermon, but it's been magnificent. Uh, I'm a preacher. I recognize preaching when I hear it. So you've got both my head and my heart uh, caught up in this, and I'm I'm just uh, beyond grateful, Jonathan. I think it, it would help us though if we had a, a kind of a specific example of a community of faith that you think is at least on the road to doing it right. Uh, you've mentioned earlier uh, a church in San Francisco that you thought was engaged in some pretty important things, including solidarity work. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you find hopeful there? Yeah, I apologize for going on preacher mode. Uh, as I was, I, I, no, I was no, no, telling no. you uh, earlier, uh, President Barnes, you know, I when I was finishing seminary, I didn't know if I wanted to be going to the ministry or into academia, and I applied for both. And churches were like, "You're nuts." <laughs> so academia is where the nuts people go, I guess. Uh, nutser than even the the ministers, I guess. Um, I, I did a, a kind of a year long ethnography on a church in San Francisco, and what I want people to hear about this church, which is called Redeemer Community Church, isn't simply that this church sees the world in this expansive imaginative capacity that I'm talking about. It's that the church is, this church is itself a lens through which to see the world as more expansive, right? So uh, these are people who, right, they, they're people like me, they come from privilege, um, they, you know, advanced college degrees, they live in Silicon Valley. Many of them are graduates from Cal and Stanford. They could have had a life of what I call in the book, the principle of exploitation, breeding exploitation, right? But these are, I'm not, I don't know if I'm particularly evangelical, but these are evangelicals who learned in college about John Perkins three R's, which I know you know about, uh, reconciliation, relocation, and redistribution. They learned about this, 
and they said that our lives are not about accumulation, especially because accumulation is built into structures of privilege and inequality. What we have in our relationships and our friendships is enough. And say they decided to live right where uh, the tourist industry in San Francisco literally leaves off the map, right? The Southwest parts of San Francisco, historically the most marginalized part of the city, uh, which became the site of breathtaking environmental racism uh, over the 20th century. Uh, these Asian, you know, largely Asian Americans moved their church to this community and said, uh, right, y'all's people are going to be our people. They're led by black churches who became their mentors um, in this community, and they made a home there. Over time, this church is Presbyterian, um, like, like PTS. Um, uh, over time, uh, they became a church. They had a bunch of techies in their thing. They all quit their day job, I mean, regular jobs. They started a software company. With the software company, they began to seriously redistribute income, right? They thought, we're not here to make money for ourselves. We're here to enter into a new way of thinking about what money is. It's what they call, right, over against the mammon economy, uh, the grace economy, what I just call deep economy, that this stuff is built into the very structures of the earth. And they were simply living into that. Uh, out of that, the distributive re, uh, income, they started a school, right? The school systems in San Francisco, like ma most merge, major urban centers are broken. They're broken by in inju injustice and inequality. They created an ec economic network where they're largely f educating um, black and brown kids in the city for free, um, a private education, right? Th there's not a lot of Christian proselytization. They're aware they're not, right? Th they're aware of the, the tendencies of colonization and settler colonialism. They want to be very circumspect. Their thinking is that we're only going to preach about the gospel when we've earned the right to do so. And we've earned the right to do so insofar as we've materially benefited people's lives. Um, but here's the thing about this community. For all the things they do around redistribution, relocation, and reconciliation, the heart of what they do grows out of their life as a church community. Um, there's this one of the, my favorite stories about this church is a woman who works um, in the software company, uh, lives in the community. She said she was a uh, she was a student at Stanford University, right? And what Stanford and places right like Princeton are are there to tell you, the world's got serious problems. You Stanford students are here to save the world. In other words, it's to say the world is damned, and it's your responsibility to fix it. She describes uh, an experience several years into her Stanford education being overwhelmed by this responsibility. Um, and she describes what she calls an, a dis depressive episode. She had become so overwhelmed by it. One of her uh, brothers was living in this Redeemer community. So she decided to take a break off, leave um, Stanford for the quarter and go live with him and his family in this community that I'm talking about. And she said, what I found there was people doing extraordinary things, but in their life, they were living, they were just ordinary people. And it was the coupling of the regular things of life, friendship, family, good work, neighbors, right? Eating um, and the things of the church, the liturgy, the litany, scripture. And she describes a moment where she felt the litany washing over her overwhelmment, that what she was drawn into wasn't a life where she was going to have to, quote, change the world. She's going to live into a world that Christ has already changed. And it was that freedom, right, that allowed her to live into a certain kind of experience. And, and there, I heard so many stories like this. I mean, I think before I heard it, you know, I, I told you, I, most of the time I'm struggling to believe in God. This was like, wow, God does exist, right? The church can be faithful, if, if only for a moment, um, right? And so what I, the book is the attempt to tell both parts of the story, the racial capitalism and its absolute domination, every kind of the connective tissue of creation and that God is God and that the world is awash in justice and mercy. How do we find that? How do we cultivate the capacity to, to see this and then begin to live into it? I, I don't think telling the story of Christianity somehow makes less radical or downplays the reality of systemic ra racism. I think living into the story of God's justice illuminates just how damaging and destructive and deadly it is.
but it also ties it to forms of life, right? That don't make injustice, I mean, that do not make justice unnatural to the world, right? If we make justice unnatural to the world, the life of anti-racism will not be sustainable for us. And if we make in, uh, justice external to the church, then it will not be through Christianity that we find possibilities, right, for hopefulness and faithfulness. So, so obviously I've kind of gone on preacher mode again. I, I want to ask you, President Barnes, so a lot of us, right, um, have heard pretty amazing things about Princeton Theological Seminary um, in the news a few years ago was a lot about what you all were doing with your history, um, specifically around uh, American chattel slavery, um, and then some things you had done around what a lot of us call reparations. I was wondering if you would talk about that and specifically how you see that relating to kind of current conversations y'all are having among Asian Americans. I mean, PTS, if people don't know, has a long legacy of kind of Asian American anti-racism. I mean, Professor, in the legend, right, and the legacy of Professor uh, Sung Kian Lee, uh, who occupied the Han chair for a number of years. You have the Asian American Programs Office, which is uh, directed by David. How, how do you guys think, how do you all think about the question of race and racism generally, given your work on reparations? But how do you think about this in relationship to Asian Americans and your community there? Um, yes, thank you for the question. Um, as you were indicating earlier, the, the, the structural and personal racism experienced by diverse peoples within our country have unique causes and are manifested differently and don't fit into single categories of thought. And I find, I find that a very compelling argument. Uh, at the same time, there are some theological claims that guide our responses to racism as sin. And that's what we've been about. Uh, the audit of the seminary's historical relationship with slavery took years to research and then after we released it, and it, there was an, another year of campus conversations, I think we had 24 different types of events, town hall meetings, uh, small group conversations, an academic co conference on it. Then came the board's response and the financial commitments that it made uh, in light of this audit. Uh, along the way, we learned, um, the great importance of using our own theological language, which was not just audit and reparations, but the language of uh, confession and repentance. Uh, confession, telling the truth, owning the truth as our truth, that this is our family story. We, and it's a story that has a legacy to it, uh, which we are participants. Confession. And then uh, repentance, uh, making substantive changes. Repentance obviously uh, involves reparations, but uh, the reason I like using that word and prefer it is that it adds the component of changing the repenter. Because our concern was not just what happened historically, but its legacy, what, what happens now as a result, because um, the sins of the past are our inheritance and we have received it. As you were indicating earlier, uh, it's very typical for whites to think in terms of a black-white binary. Uh, but this year, I think uh, there was no greater ally to our Asian and Asian American students than the Black Student Association. Uh, their leadership has met regularly with the leadership of our Asian American Student Association. Close friendships have been made, and it's been wonderful seeing them. Uh, address concerns together. Um, and our faculty also has offered good leadership to the in response to the violence and the crimes being experienced by Asians and Asian Americans this year, um, as well as our own historic patterns of racism. Uh, they've had some thoughtful discussions at faculty meetings. We're certainly not done with that. We'll be continuing again as early as next month with a facilitator, but it will continue through the next um, year and in the years after that. Uh, the faculty published a letter to the students expressing their commitment uh, to our Asian American students and Asian students 
and have collectively reviewed their syllabi just to see how often Asian or Asian American uh, authors show up. It's all still a uh, confession and repentance. Uh, I also addressed the uh, right uh, the whole seminary community after the Atlanta shootings. I don't think this makes us unique. I believe most of the divinity schools and faculties are engaged in similar ac actions. Uh, we'll begin the search for the new Han professor again in September. We're thrilled uh, that David Chow uh, began a full-time capacity as uh, the director of our Asian American program last fall. I guess, Jonathan, the most important thing I would say is that we confess we have a very, very long way to go. Hmm. Yeah, one, in kind of walking into um, this conference, um, along with David, uh, 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 Bo, Karen Lee has been remarkable. Yesterday, she held a prayer time for us just to pray over us. Um, which, you know, I, I felt a little bit like that, that, um, um, person I talked about taking in both the severity of sin, but also trying to speak hope, uh, and, and feeling overwhelmed and, you know, the work that she has done, the ministry there, other faculty, and I've gotten to know a number of the students at PTS, just remarkable moments of hope and courage in the, in, in a place and time that often, uh, is it has very little of it, um, and and I think it's things like that that say, that confirm the sense that justice and mercy are natural to this world, no matter how oftentimes it is defaced, um, buried under uh, the, the awful things that we do to one another. Um, so, uh, thank you for uh, asking about uh, what I'm thinking about and um, the the witness of what y'all are doing um, from people from the outside. I just think is. Um, I think it's impressive and inspiring. Well, thank you, Jonathan. And thank you for such profound uh, responses to these questions, uh, things that are gonna continue to stay again in my head and my heart. You got into both of today uh, and uh, that's spectacular communication. And I, uh, I am uh, challenged and moved uh, by this hour. Thank you so much. Thank you, President Barnes. Thank you, President Barnes. Thank you, Professor Tran, for just an extremely invigorating fireside chat. The text box was exploding with commentary. We're going to end the session. And what I recommend for those who would like to follow up in conversation with Jonathan Tran is to go to the lounge. Uh, actually, when I was on lunch break, I, I ended up in the same lounge table with Jonathan and we already had a really invigorating lunch break conversation with the group. So um, experiment with the lounge tables, check out the exhibit booths. And of course we have day two, uh, which will start tomorrow again at 9.15 a.m. Eastern time with my opening remarks and we'll follow a similar pattern of Half an, hour panel, uh, half an hour sessions with panels at the end of the morning session with more panel discussion in the afternoon. This has been a tremendous first day of our Asian American Theology Conference. And thank you to all the attendees for making it such a invigorating conversation. So I'm gonna end the session and we can look for each other in the lounge area. David, just before you go, uh, since I know I'll get lost even on a digital format, do I go to a particular table? Yeah, I'll I'll set one up. I'll set one up and I'll call it Jonathan's table, so you can't miss it. Or people can absolutely avoid it too. Uh, yeah, so. it'll be the first table, first table on the bottom left in the lounge area. Thanks, folks.